Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. This is Peter's last message. It's part of my attraction to Second Timothy, right? Last words are, are words of first importance. When someone's drawing their dying breath, I hope they want to share something that's important and urgent. And, you know, you've got that in Second Peter 1 where Peter's saying, hey, I'm writing and I want to remind you of important things. Welcome to Know the Truth. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd, and today you're in for a special edition of the show. We're about to sit down with Pastor Philip DeCourcy for a personal conversation about some seasonable topics, including some personal updates from Philip and an introduction to Philip's timely news series on the importance of godly knowledge called Things You Need to Know. And to guide the discussion, here's Know the Truth's Executive Director, Dean Samsvik. Thanks a lot, Wayne. It's good to be in the studio again today with pastor and author Philip DeCourcy. Philip, thanks for taking the time to join us today. Dean, it's great to be in the office with you, and hopefully we uh, can touch base with our listening audience today. Great. So before we dive into the interview, it's hard to believe we're almost halfway through 2022. Uh, Just wondering, how are things going for you personally so far in this year, and are there any notable events personally? Well, you know, um, things are going well. I mean, it's that old adage, I'm doing better than I deserve, uh, you know, both in my Christian life and my church life. God's goodness and mercy continues to follow me, and um, I've been delivered from evil. And uh, just God's good. The family's doing well. My little granddaughter's growing up and is a joy. And the church is doing well, as you know. Um, You work alongside me there at Kenwood Community Church. Our church is growing, growing through change. You know, we've talked about this before. I think the whole pandemic, I think the whole, uh, you know, disturbances across our nation has brought about a shifting and a sifting. And and we have seen people leave the state of California, and we've, we've wrestled with that. But uh, in God's goodness, um, for every family loss, we have picked up a family. And uh, the, the, what I'm hearing, Dean, just from the new families that are coming, they're uh, you know, they're, they're looking uh, for a church that it's, you know, marked by clarity and conviction and courage. Um, I, I think a lot of Christians have been disturbed at how silent and weak the church was through the pandemic, uh, almost went into hiding. You know, years and years ago, Leonard Ravenhill, a great old writer on revival, challenged every pastor about you want to grow your church by birth not by adoption. And and I understand that. And we have seen conversion. We've seen baptisms. Uh, but we have grown by adoption. And, and, and yet I embrace it in the sense that I think people are, you know, they're like theological fugitives trying to find a place where the Word of God is preached. And, and church is church. It's where the church gathers to worship God, break bread, pray, disciple one another, and then break the huddle and go out into the world to uh, evangelize. So, uh, you know, to summarize, Dean, these are the the worst of times, but in some ways they're the best of times. And, you know, not without its problems, things that can be community church. And also here at the in the radio ministry, uh, we're doing well. And I think, you know, if, if we continue to honor God and let God speak through what he has spoken, um, I'm hoping to continue to enjoy his benediction. That's great. So, Obviously, the last few years have been very tumultuous for the world, our country, um, in particular for Christians, as you referred to a few seconds ago. We've you know, seen huge developments, you know, not just medically in COVID, but all of the government uh, reactions to COVID, not both nationally as well as globally. Uh, we've witnessed big news in politics, global affairs, wars. Um, while we don't have time to talk about things in specific, is there any pastoral guidance you can provide to a believer who's struggling with the uncertainty of life in the world. Uh, Maybe they're struggling with grasping the concept that God is still in control despite all the upheaval in the world. Uh, Dean, that's a great question. There's a phrase I've come across in in, uh, just my reading that's really been a blessing to me. 
uh, when things look like they're falling apart, they're really falling into place. And as we look out, in fact, I just took part in a prophecy conference. Uh, one of our board members here at uh, Know the Truth is uh, Mark Hitchcock, a, a prolific prophetic writer, 25 books. And uh, he hosted a conference in Oklahoma. I was one of the speakers, uh, Jeff Kenley, and Mark himself, uh, Jack Hibbs, and uh, Amir Safari. And uh, we, we addressed all those issues. They looked at the, what's going on globally, the global reset. We looked at the Middle East and the tensions that continue to be there. We looked at Russia rising and what's going on in Ukraine. And here was, here's my takeaway to answer your question. You know, um, one of the phrases that came out of that conference was, I think we're witnessing a prophetic shift of gears. Now, I've, I've always been careful. I don't think anybody can charge me with sensationalism when it comes to my views on eschatology, prophecy, in the last days. I think it would be a matter of blindness not to believe we live in significant days. Uh, there, there's a prophetic shift of gears going on since 1948 with the return of Israel to the land. The world has begun to take shape in terms of just how the Bible sees the last days unfolding. You know, I think it was Jack Hibbs who said, uh, you know, the Bible talks about the last days. John the Apostle talks about the last hour. <laughs> we may be in the dying minutes. Who knows? Um, and we know this. The rapture is without signs. Um, but the rapture won't take place in a vacuum. It's my conviction that the church won't go through the tribulation for several reasons. But the rapture is imminent, could happen at any moment. And in a sense, um, nothing has to be fulfilled for that to take place. It's an any moment return that has me on my, the tiptoes of expectancy and has me uh, hopefully on my game as a Christian because as soon as Jesus returns, I go to the judgment seat and I have to give an account for my life. I better not be wasting it. I better not have, be climbing the ladder uh, against the wrong wall and all of that. But as soon as the rapture takes place, Dean, um, several events will unfold. As you look at the world, uh, Russia is a menace. Uh, Persia is mentioned in Ezekiel 38 as invading Israel. That's Iran. We've got the whole Iran nuclear issue. We've got the whole deal that's going on right now. China is a power in the east. You've got Europe now at the center of politics. We've got a war going on in Europe for the first time in decades. Israel is there, and her life, you know, is always under threat. We're watching the days of Lot and Noah unfold culturally here in America and across the Western world. We see apostasy see in the church a weak theological life in the church. Hearts are growing cold, you know, so stop the presses right there. The rapture won't take place in a vacuum. And since all the stage has been set, the players are in place. I'm not saying Jesus is coming tonight, but I'm actually saying, too, he could come he tonight. Could, absolutely, um, yeah. and, and therefore, my take is this. Things aren't falling apart. Things are falling into place. God is sovereign. The prophetic clock is ticking towards midnight. And we have the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. And my task at that conference, Dean, was to address the issue of what do we do? And I preached from Second Peter, one of the things we'll talk about, holiness, diligence, evangelism. We looked at, you know, knowing your theology and guarding against deception. Warren Wearsby said this, and with this I end, God didn't give us prophecy so that we might build a calendar. God gave us prophecy that he might build a character. Absolutely. And, and so um, it's, I can connect the dots. I can see the outline of prophetic fulfillment, but it's got to change my everyday dedication and, and how I spend my time and how I live for Christ. And it urges me to share the gospel with my friends. That's great. Yeah, Phil, not to get ahead of ourselves, but when we talk in a few minutes about your new series on Second Peter, um, you, you dive into that very much when you get to chapter three. Uh, and uh, I'd encourage the listeners to yeah. keep that in the back of your mind. When that was we get one to of the, the attractions yeah. to study was, yeah. that book, and it's so focused on prophecy. Right, right. And, and as you mentioned, it w the real focus is how does that impact your life? And, right. and it's, it's great to know all the facts and what's going to happen, but it should have an impact. So great, yeah. uh, great uh, outline there. So, Philip, we primarily want to talk about the new series we're starting in Second Peter, but I want to spend just a couple minutes with you talking about a series of messages we just finished on Know the Truth called Ready, Set, Go, which is the first part of a, a larger broadcast series 
we're going to be uh, broadcasting throughout the year called Essential Jesus. And and it's really a, a study, a very in-depth study through the Gospel of Mark. I guess one question, you know, what value can be gained by studying the life of Christ chronologically as laid out in a gospel like the book of Mark? Sure. Well, I mean, the Gospels are, are, are key to our understanding of, of the beginnings of Christianity and the basis of Christianity. Christianity is Christ, right? It's not a set of rules. It's Christ. It's a person. Um, the marvel that he's God in human flesh, virgin born, uh, sinless. The marvel that he became a substitute and a sacrifice for our sin on the cross, conquered death, rose and promise to return. Christianity is all about the person and work of Christ. That's why Paul says in his letter to the Colossians, in all things, he must have the preeminence. And the Gospels are preeminently about him, and that's why they're preeminently important and significant to us, right? There's a little phrase in Colossians, Dean, Christ who is our life. He's become our life now, and that makes a study of his life all the more important. So Mark is a wonderful study looking at Christ the servant, and it allows us to follow his ministry and mark the uniqueness of of his person and his power in miracles, the purpose of his death, his triumph. Uh, We've got this historical accounting of the beginnings of Christianity, and and so it's very foundational that you and I study the Gospels, and I picked one of them, Mark, and to go through it chronologically is also helpful because we see Jesus birth, and we see Jesus' obscurity, and then we see his emergence into public life, his baptism, his temptation, his preaching, his miracles, his message. And then we see his focus on going to Jerusalem to die for our sin, and his triumph over the grave, and in his commission out into the world. So very important that our listeners track us on Mark's gospel. It's the shorter of the gospels, but Christianity is Christ. And to study him chronologically in the Gospels is a very important discipline. Very good. Any Anything particular about Mark that stood out as compared to the other Gospels? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, every Gospel is unique. John, uh, again, slightly different in focus. Uh, but, you know, we've got a focus in Matthew on Christ the King. We've got a focus in Luke on Christ the Son of Man. And we've got a focus in Mark on Christ the Servant. I think that's one of the unique things about Mark. One of the reasons I chose the book, Dean, it's the shorter of the Gospels, and it's action-packed. There's a phrase that appears 42 times in Mark's Gospel immediately. And so, and interestingly, we don't begin with the birth of Jesus. It just straight in uh, to his public ministry, his preaching. And um, there's, there's this fast-paced focus, and this focus on him as servant. And we want to you know, take from that, uh, that we've got to commit ourselves to service like him. Another thing that strikes me uh, is how quickly Mark gets to the cross. Um, It's 16 chapters, but the last week of Jesus' life is 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Because Mark wants to remind us as a gospeler that at the heart of the Christian faith, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul will echo that in 1 Corinthians 15. This is a matter of first importance that Jesus died for our sin according to the Scripture and was buried and then rose again according to the Scripture. And Mark wants us to get that. You know what? To become a Christian isn't to keep the golden rule of the Sermon on the Mount. To become a Christian is to own your sin, repent of your sin, and trust Christ alone as the sin-bearing Savior, Lord of life, conqueror of death, and the one who promises eternal life. So I love it. Mark gets us to the heartbeat of the Christian faith, which is the cross, the shed blood, the undying love of God for us in the death of his Son, and the triumph over death. And then one other thing would be Mark himself, right? This is John Mark. This is the guy that Barnabas and Paul fall out over. Yep. Uh, this is a failure. This is a guy who turns tail. And yet, Second Timothy 4, verse 11, at the end of Paul's ministry, we read, hey, bring John Mark. He's profitable for me. So I love the theme. Here's a failure that God uses who gets to write a gospel. Uh, who has a, a significant story. You know, I just, I love the thought that, you know, God's got a wonderful return policy uh, on damaged goods. And I want to just say to someone listening today, if you're discouraged, you've failed, you've fallen, and you wonder if God will take you back, Mark is a wonderful example 
of the fact that when we repent and we come back to God, he meets us like the father in the story of the prodigal son. I love Jonah 3 verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second Second time. time. You know, God is a God of second chances. Uh, God is a God of new beginnings. So those are some of the things, Dean, that I just find attractive about Mark's gospel. That's great. Well, thanks for those insights. And any of our listeners who didn't get a chance to hear the Ready, Set, Go uh, series um, that we just finished, uh, you can find uh, all the past broadcasts on our website, ktt.org, or our app as well. You're listening to Know the Truth, and today you're listening to a special interview with Philip DeCourcy. There's still much more to come in this conversation, but first, we'd like to invite you to connect with us online. If you'd like to stay in the loop of exciting news and events, just look for us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter by searching for Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, and then be sure to click follow and leave us a note. We'd love to hear from you. But now let's get back to the conversation with Dean and Philip. Just a reminder that you're listening to Know the Truth, and we're in the studio today with pastor and author Philip DeCourcy. If you're new to the ministry, we'd encourage you to listen to one of our broadcasts or to visit our website at ktt.org. So, Philip, next week we're starting a new broadcast on Know the Truth. It's a brand new series you recently taught titled Things You Need to Know. It's a verse-by-verse exposition through the book of Second Peter. What in particular led you to the book of Second Peter, and why do you believe it's an important book for today's Christians to be studying? Dean, you're going to be disappointed with my answer. <laughs> okay. in the, in the, pragmatically, the first thing that attracted me to Second Peter was it was short. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'd done several long series in the church uh, in exposition. I like it when you're honest. Phil. Exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, I said, hey, I need to do something short. Um, so that was, to some degree, the beginning. I was looking at some of the New Testament epistles and books in the New Testament that we could cover in a, in a short period of time. So pragmatically, it was a short book. But more than that uh, was just the attraction to the theme of knowledge and the fact that this is Peter's last message. It's part of my attraction to Second Timothy, right? Yeah. Last words are, are words of first importance. When someone's drawing their dying breath, I hope they want to share something that's important and urgent and significant and weighty. And, you know, you've got that in Second Peter 1 where Peter's saying, hey, I'm writing and I want to remind you of important things. And when I looked at the letter, he wants to focus on this, this idea of knowledge. Uh, it begins in chapter 1, verse 2. He prays their, their knowledge of God would be multiplied. Uh, chapter 3, verse 18, he talks about growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So Peter's, you know, lifting his pen up for the last time. Uh, this, the sun is setting on his life. He sees clouds gathering over the church in terms of persecution. He sees challenges inside the church with false teachers. And he writes, here's what I want you to know. Get this down. And chapter one's about getting to know things about our faith and how we can add to our faith, diligence and knowledge and all of that. Then chapter two is about a knowledge of our foes, that the church is always in danger of having the gospel diluted and corrupted. And then in chapter 3, which we just talked about, you've got this fantastic emphasis on the last day as the day of God, that this world is going to end in a, in a great conflagration. And if the world's going to be burned up, it should set us on fire. So those themes of diligence and growing in faith, those themes of the danger of deception, those themes of the second coming and living for first things in the last days, That was the magnet. That was the attraction. Great. So you you titled the series Things You Need to Know, and you sort of already hit this a little bit, but what is the significance of a believer knowing what, uh, in this case, Peter wanted to pass along? What is is the importance of knowledge in the the life of a believer? It's it's fundamental. Uh, You know, without knowledge, you can't be a Christian. We put our faith in a body of truth of which we have come to know and understand, right? John 17 talks about this is life eternal, that we might know you, the true and the living God. This is one of the the marvelous things about the Christian faith, that Christian faith is rooted and grows out of a belief in revelation, that God has made himself known. God has revealed himself. Um, He's revealed himself and his invisible attributes in the visible creation. Right? The heavens declare his glory. We see something of God there. Uh, God has revealed himself um, through prophets 
And yet in the last days, God has spoken and revealed himself through his son. And this has all been recorded for us accurately and without error and sufficiently in the word of God. And so we live in an age, Dean, where we're drowning in a deluge of information, but we lack wisdom. Yep. All right. We know more. Um, than any generation before us about science and our body and the world around us and the heavens above us. And yet I've never met more confused people right. in my life. Absolutely. And that's the, that's the irony. We've, we've got more knowledge than ever before, yet we lack wisdom. And Second Peter was partly, there's another attraction to me. I want my people, I want the church at Kindred and through these broadcasts, the church at large, to know certain things that God has revealed about their faith, about their foes, about their future. And, and you know, some things are fundamental. Um, you know, it's a great story about uh, Albert Einstein. I mean, one of the greatest minds that we have ever known. And yet his students will tell you that he couldn't tell you many feet were in a mile. And, and when he was asked why he doesn't know these simple things, here was his answer. I make it a rule not to clutter my mind with simple information that I can find in a book in five minutes. His point is this. Our minds can be cluttered with stuff, and it, it, it pushes out the, the fundamental and the essential. Second Peter, and this theme of knowledge, brings us back to fundamental things. Remember, this is Peter's swan song. And Peter's saying, hey, before I go, before I sign off, before the light gets switched off, here's what you need to know. At okay. that point, we need to be listening, Dean. Right, right. So, um, you know, you, you, you've already mentioned a number of the topics, but anything in particular that might have hit you as a pastor that uh, stood out as, a, as an important point? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, for me personally as a pastor, it's it's that theme of legacy. The thing that struck me is Peter says this in chapter 1, Therefore I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I'm in my earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. I find that very challenging. I also find it very comforting. Our thanks to both men. Thank you, Philip and Dean. You're listening to Know the Truth, and we've been enjoying a conversation with Pastor Philip DeCourcy about his upcoming series, Things You Need to Know, a study on the importance of godly knowledge. We just wrapped up our Essential Jesus Ready, Set, Go series, but you still have a chance to access this action-packed study on the Gospel of Mark. All 78 messages are available in an easy-to-use USB thumb drive for only $15. Order the USB or access the free message archive at ktt.org. It's Philip's hope that these studies encourage you to boldly share the gospel with others. After all, what could be more important than the message of forgiveness and eternal salvation through Christ's work on the cross? That's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. And that's what we share each day on Know the Truth. We boldly proclaim the truth of God's Word, and through Know the Truth, you can share this message with your friends and neighbors when you give to this Bible teaching ministry. Donate today to send the gospel out to listeners all over the world. Call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. And when you give in May, we'll send you a special book by Johnny Erickson Tata. It's called Timeless Hymns for Family Worship. This book will help you and your family find comfort and strength through praise and worship. Request this special hymnal collection for yourself or as a gift for Mother's Day when you give to Know the Truth today. Call 888 888- 644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. And if you're new to Know the Truth, we'd like to send you a free booklet to welcome you. It's called Seven Days of Truth, Resting in God's Daily Sufficiency. You can request your copy at ktt.org. I'm Wayne Shepherd, and that's all the time we have today, but don't forget to join us again tomorrow as we continue this personal conversation with Pastor Philip. There's still things you need to know. Friday, I know the truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.